Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Two Amber Alerts now issued in our area in just the past 24 hours. The first involves helicopters, federal agents and local police at a northwest side apartment complex. It is all hands on deck in the search for missing three year old Lena Sarder Keel. Now police are focused on Fredericksburg Road near Wurzbach Road. The night team's Patty Santos has been outside that complex talking to people who live in the area. So Patty, you've been there for hours already. What do you know? What have you seen? Well, I can tell you there's a lot of concerns from the community, from people that live around this apartment complex where Lena Kill was last seen. And you can see behind me here, there is still a pretty strong police presence as the search continues. Tonight, we saw a heavy police presence inside the Villas de Cabo apartment buildings, but also in the apartments neighboring this complex. Police have been walking the premises, watching the parking lots and knocking on doors through the entire block radius. Every vehicle that comes in and out of the apartment complex is searched. The FBI command vehicles arrived just a few hours ago to set up post in the apartment complex. Margaret Constantino, who works with the refugee community, tells us Lena Kill's family are Afghan refugees. So they're new to the community and they're probably very scared and they don't know who can help them. So they've got a lot of people around them right now that are trying to help find this baby. Neighbors tell us they feel pretty helpless not being able to do more to find her. It just kills me that, you know, we don't take care of our kids anymore. You know what I mean? And I ain't talking about parents. I'm just talking about the community. And we got to take care of our children. You know, they are futures. And just looking at the situation here, when we first got here a few hours ago, there was still a strong police presence, but we have seen officers start to leave. The FBI vehicle that we mentioned there also left the scene. But again, this is where the focus has been the entire time. If you have any information on her, she's three years old. She was last seen a, wearing a, a black jacket and a red dress. Call police if you have information and if you can help police tonight. We'll send it back to you. All right, Patty, thank you. And now we're going to talk about another search tonight. This one for a man facing several charges of sexual exploitation of children. Investigators say 40 year old Jonathan Wright, that's the guy right there, is a wanted man who crossed state lines with his family. Now they're believed to be in Medina County. The night team's Lee Waldman spoke to the Medina County Sheriff who's worried about those kids. He's concerned because those three kids are facing another night out in the cold. In fact, just over 40 minutes ago, an Amber Alert was issued for the kids because they're in danger. They've been living off the land since the family car broke down. Investigators believe Wright's been in the area for about three weeks now. Medina County Sheriff say Jonathan A. Wright of North Carolina and his three kids, Jonathan 11, Lucas 9, and Ariana 8, were last seen at Settlers Pass, a neighborhood in Rio Medina outside of Castroville. Canines, helicopters, and drones all helped search along FM 2676. Sheriff Randy Brown says Jonathan A. Wright faces child sex charges out of Mooresville, North Carolina. Investigators first learned about the case after coming across Wright's wife and two older children. Sheriff Brown says they are safe and cooperating. The sheriff says it's time for the rest of the family to get to safety. My understanding his kids think their dad hung the moon. Well, he needs to step up and, and let them be in a safe place while he goes and fights his own battle. The search was put on hold tonight. Brown says they'll be out in the area in the morning, but they're looking for tips on where to focus their search. Any of his children call 911 or the Medina County Dispatch Office. That number is 830-741-6153. Steve, Stephania. Thank you, Lee. Now we're going to continue to update you on both searches on air and online. And this is a really good opportunity to remind you to download the KSAT app because you can use it to get updates straight to your phone. And new tonight, it is state funding. Millions of dollars of it meant to help pregnant women and parents with young children. But in a three month investigation, the defenders discovered a San Antonio nonprofit using much of that money on other things. Yeah, we're talking about things like vehicles, trips to Las Vegas, and on a private business, a West Side smoke shop. As our Dylan Collier reports, that's just the tip of the iceberg. This nonprofit has the hopeful sounding name of a new life for a new generation. 
an apt moniker for an organization meant to help young mothers and their newborns. But in late March, New Life wrote Daryl Wayne Shelton a check for $25,000 for the purchase of this lot at 6743 Buena Vista Street. What for? Shelton claims New Life president and founder Marquisha Ree told him it would be used to store her nonprofit's vehicles, then also said she planned to build a house there for her grandchildren. But just 11 days after the deed was finalized in August, the Texas Department of Agriculture granted Reed's family member a license to produce industrial hemp on the property. Reed later bragged about the milestone on her Instagram page, telling her followers, quote, I can now grow CBD. But when asked by us about nonprofit funds being used for the purchase, Reed quickly retreated inside a nearby smoke shop she owns. Marquisha? I'm Dylan with KSAT 12. Uh -huh. We'll hear about the funds that were used from New Life to pay for the hemp lot on Buena Vista. What? Um, no, come on, let's go. Let me get him in. Sure, sure. Moments later, I need my records back. Reed told us through a locked door that she did not want to look bad on TV. The Texas Attorney General's office was made aware of financial irregularities at New Life in a complaint filed in mid-October, including the allegation that Reed has been using money received from the state and donors for her own personal gain. AG officials have not responded to multiple requests from the defenders for an update on the case. The land purchase is just the beginning. 20 months of bank statements provided to the defenders by a source within New Life reveal a multitude of questionable purchases, many of them for Reed side business, R&J CBD Smoke and Vapor Lounge, conveniently located just a block away from New Life's headquarters. Questionable expenditures like this $714 payment for t-shirts in April, just two months before Reed officially registered the business. It was made from New Life to Toro Imports, a company that calls itself Texas's largest wholesaler of smoke shop products. The builder hired to refurbish r &J this summer confirms receiving this $2,000 New Life check signed by Reed as payment for some of her work. The woman, who asked that we not use her name, said she took measurements and pictures at New Life as well, but only ever did remodeling work at r &J. Even more disturbing, contractor Earl Greenwood was given a check from New Life for $20,000 in late March for water damage repairs inside its West Commerce location. But Greenwood told us in a taped phone interview he cashed the check and gave the money back to Reed, who then handed him $1,000. When we asked Greenwood if he did any water damage repairs, he told us, quote, I did nothing in regards to the water damage. In fact, the landlord for that same West Commerce location confirms that he actually took care of the damage, paying another contractor several thousand dollars to replace sheetrock and a pipe that burst during February's winter storm. To see this happening in our town, I mean, it, it just, it, it hurts. Jason Mesa is regional director of the Better Business Bureau of San Antonio, which also accredits and approves charities through its Wise Giving Alliance. He says on top of the bank statements, New Life's tax paperwork indicates that something is amiss. Its latest publicly available 990 form from 2019, what Mesa describes as the gold standard to measure any charity or nonprofit, is blank under the sections that list program service accomplishments, a trend that appears in New Life's 2018 and 2017 federal tax filings as well. The 2019 990 also lists zero under fundraising and shows that less than 20% of New Life's expenses are actually going towards programs. So that itself would not pass a BBB charity accreditation right off the bat. But under the surface, there might be more going on that we just can't see. Um, so yes, major red flag, a lot of holes in the 990 form itself. Um, expenses don't match up with what's going on with the money coming in. Um, a lot of things just don't add up. So how exactly does New Life's money come in? After being granted tax exempt status in late 2016, it became part of the state's alternatives to abortion program. Funding flows from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission to an administrator called the Texas Pregnancy Care Network, or TPCN, 
which then reimburses New Life for providing services like diapers and formula and counseling for young moms. HHSC figures for New Life show it has received more than two and a half million dollars in reimbursements since the third quarter of 2018, including more than a million dollars last year alone, making up a vast majority of its total funding from all sources. TPCN Executive Director John McNamara refused multiple requests to be interviewed for this story, and after saying he would answer questions via email, stopped responding when we inquired about his organization's agreement with New Life and what stipulations the nonprofit must follow when spending reimbursement funds. There was no data, and there still, in my opinion, is relatively little data that provides any kind of accountability for this program. State Representative Donna Howard is chair of the Texas Women's Health Caucus. Right. Well, she has sounded the alarm on the lack of transparency within the project, program. while her fellow lawmakers have expanded the program, known as A2A, to a budget of around $50 million a year. And while Health and Human Services has supposed safeguards built into the program, Howard says it does not have the staffing levels needed to properly monitor the spending of its contractors and subcontractors. We're wasting taxpayer dollars on a program that, number one, doesn't have tell us that it's doing what it says it's supposed to do. When we have tremendous need to help women actually get the health services they need. And there's more. Tomorrow on the Night Beat, a $32,000 motorcycle, limousine rides, and then there's those trips we mentioned, funded with money meant for new life programs. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Temperatures warming up out there, at least gradually the rest of this week. We went from the 50s the past couple of days to the 60s this afternoon. That was after a chilly start of 37 degrees. And we did make it into the low 70s closer to the Rio Grande. Our made headlines here, the gradual warming trend the rest of this week. And for Christmas, it's going to warm up. We're looking at some low 80s. We'll talk about what else to expect in just a bit. Also, take a look at the newest addition at Methodist Hospital. That, my friends, is Bambi. We're going to tell you how she's helping pa patients in San Antonio coming up. And the Omicron variant quickly spreading. One part of Texas already recovering cases of the recording cases of the variant in children. Plus the president's response plan next on the Night Beat. This Essay Salute Holiday Greeting is brought to you by the Joe A. Gomez Law Firm. Hi, I'm Matt Powell from the Gomez Law Firm, wishing all of our service members and their families a safe and happy holiday season. Tonight, we're hearing about the first Omicron cases in children. The Houston Chronicle is reporting that Texas Children's Hospital found the COVID-19 variant in some of its pediatric patients. Some of those kids are under the age of five, so they're way too young to get the vaccine and cases are only expected to rise. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden is laying out a plan to respond to the Omicron variant. The administration wants to make sure that everyone has access to an at home COVID test kit. We'll be getting these tests to Americans for free. And we'll have websites where you can get them delivered to your home. So part of the plan also includes new sites where people can go and get tested and vaccinated. This is coming after an unvaccinated man from Texas died from the Omicron variant and health experts continue to advise people to get the vaccine and their booster shots. All right, so speaking of vaccines, Metro Health is going to be administering them tomorrow at Travis Park. Everyone five and up is eligible to go and get their shots, and people getting their second dose will also be eligible for a free gift card. And you can check out the Christmas tree, maybe do a little ice skating, also get a free shot. It's going to happen tomorrow from 10 in the morning to 5 in the evening. All right, look at this little guy. A new therapy animal at Methodist Hospital is turning heads and making patients smile. Bambi, not exactly what you'd expect to see in a medical facility, but her handler tells the night team's Lee Waldman she hopes Bambi's success opens the door for other animals to follow in her hoof steps. What's got four hooves, a long tail, a snazzy vest, and matching pink bows? Methodist Hospital's newest employee, Bambi the Miniature Therapy Horse. There. <laughs> She makes hospital visits to patients and just kind of get their morales up in spirits since she's at the since they're at the hospital. 
Bambi does her job well, from older patients to young kids, even the doctors and nurses in between. Bambi spreads joy. She's the first hospital-based therapy horse in our state and works alongside three full-time therapy dogs. But we're all asking the same question here. Why a mini horse? This pandemic, it was very, very hard on everyone, including the healthcare workers, the patients coming into the hospital, the visitors coming into the hospital. Um, and we were just trying to see, okay, what can we do to brighten up people's spirits? Seeing the unexpected has physical benefits as well, like lowering blood pressure and reducing physical pain. Bambi has been working for two months now. Ferris hopes she'll pave the way for other animals to join their fleet. There can be pigs as therapy animals. There can be many other therapy animals out there. And I think she just shows that it doesn't just have to be a dog that brings light into someone's eyes. Bambi is still young, only four years old, so she doesn't have a set schedule just yet. But if you see her around, feel free to give her a pat. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Bambi. Cute. Oh, Bambi. I'm looking outside right now. We've got a clear sky currently. We could turn, we, that could turn into a little bit of fog early tomorrow morning, but mostly just a heavy dew on the ground. So we talked about the temperatures and how they're going to be on the upswing. Let's get right to it. First of all, a beautiful sunset this evening with our almanac data here. We had some mid-level clouds stream overhead and that really set the scene for a beautiful sunset on a beautiful day. 37 this morning, 66 by the afternoon and temperatures were, are only going up from here, at least in terms of highs. There is some cold air out there. It's off to the north and still bottled up to the north and that's where it's going to stay for the next week or so. It's not going to really budge southward and really get down to our part of Texas here. But locally, you look at the readings, 40s to near 50 right now. 50 downtown, even 53 Gonzales, 46 Carrizo Springs, 42 in Kerrville. And most of us in the low to mid 40s to start the day tomorrow at sunrise when we typically have our low temperature, low to mid 40s, we'll say 45 in San Antonio, at least downtown, cooler in outline areas. And then by the afternoon tomorrow, we're up into the 70s. So we went from the 50s the past couple of days to 60s today into the 70s tomorrow and Thursday, Christmas Eve, 80 degrees. Christmas Day, about 82 the high temperature. And by the way, Sunday, day after Christmas here, 83. That's what we're expecting. That would actually tie the record for the day. So we've got some record challenging warmth headed our way. Dew points now mostly in the 40s, so lack of mugginess in the air. That's going to change a little bit though, and you'll notice the stickiness back by Friday and especially on into Christmas Day. That's going to lead to some areas of fog as well. Big picture shows not a lot of activity across the nation, just a little bit in the southeastern U.S. That's a system that affected us over the weekend and a little bit on the west coast as well. So as we go through the night tonight, temperatures just gradually falling off, and then we'll start the day tomorrow at 45 degrees. By the noon hour, we're already into the 60s and then a high temperature of 73. Some high thin clouds streaming overhead. Mornings closer to 60, so Christmas morning near 60. By the afternoon, low 80s and a bit of mugginess. The record high on Christmas is 90 back in 1955. All right, Adam, thank you. All right, big news tonight from Manu. Manu Ginobili deserves any accolade you can pass along to him, including Absolutely. a Hall of Fame nomination. That's coming, and when we come back, he's not the only Spurs connection to this class of 2022. We will explain. And did the Dallas Cowboys clinch the NFC East tonight with a Washington loss coming up? Ginobili. Oh, Ginobili with the move. It's oh. good. Manu Ginobili leads the list for the first time nominees for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, but he's not the only one being considered that has a Spurs connection. More on that coming up in Big Board Sports, but first. With star running back Sincere McCormick declaring for the draft and three other of his teammates working on their pro careers and health and safety protocols, the UTSA Roadrunners came in a nice tropical smoothie cafe Frisco Bowl shorthanded against San Diego State. Brendan Brady getting the start tonight at running back and Brady getting the rock going right up the middle into the secondary going all the way to the 15-yard line for a 27-yard gain. A couple of plays later, Frank Harris to Corey and Clark who makes a great grab along the sideline in the end zone for the 12-yard score, 7-0 UTSA. Late first quarter now, game tied at 7, Road Runners on the Aztec two-yard line. They give it to Brady and scores to make it 14-7 after one. But UTSA would be down 17-14 going to the third. UTSA down 14 now on the Aztec's three-yard line. Harris hits Sakari Franklin on the slant. And the Roadrunners are only down seven going to the four, but that's as close as they could get. Roadrunners still looking for their first bowl win. They fall 38-24, ending their incredible season at 12-2.
touchdown. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. With Dak Prescott still not 100% in the passing game since his calf injury, the Cowboys have been relying on their run game. That's even with two banged up running backs in Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard and an offensive line that has had its share of injuries, including star left tackle Tyron Smith. Smith is trying to recover from an ankle injury with Pollard nursing the foot injury and Elliott, who wore a brace to protect his knee, he injured in week four. Still, Zeke was able to score a 13-yard touchdown on the 21-6 win over the Giants, and he and Pollard combined for 126 yards. They told P-O-L-L that uh, that we Zeke takes on the defense when he uh, with his power, and uh, uh, that's that's very impactful in the game. This is not finesse out here. This is hard-nosed football that we're trying to establish with that run. On the other hand, you saw it. Pollard has such explosive ability to hit the hole. And so both of them are, frankly, are very complimentary. They're complimentary. And so um, I'm glad we've got them, and I'm glad they're as healthy as they are. All right, COVID-19 pushed back the Washington-Philadelphia game to the night. Washington down over 20 players and seven coaches due to the virus. That's good news for Cowboy fans. We're rooting for the Eagles to win because that will move the Cowboys closer to the NFC's title. Washington jumps out to a 10-0 lead thanks to two Eagle turnovers, but the Eagles tie the game at 10 just before the half when Jalen Hurts scores on a quarterback keeper. Four quarter now, Washington only down by three. Not for long, Hurts going to Greg Ward Jr. on the 19-yard touchdown. The Eagles win at 27-17, have won four of their last five, tied for the last wild card spot. Four time in. NBA champion Manu Ginobili headlines a list of first-time nominees for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, but he's not the only one with a Spurs connection being considered. Next. Manu Ginobili was part of four of the Spurs' five NBA championships, leads the list of first-time nominees in the class of 2022 for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Ginobili, who is back with the organization as a special advisor, was an integral part of four Spurs NBA titles, including 2003, 2005, 7, and 2014, before he retired in 2018. He was also an international basketball star, leading Argentina to the gold medal in 2004. But Manu is not the only person with a Spur connection that is up for the class of 2022. So is Becky Hammond, became the first full-time female Female assistant coach in NBA history in 2014. That's after a stellar 15-year career in the WNBA that included eight with the San Antonio Stars, where she was a six-time WNBA All-Star. And former Spur George Carl, who is six all-time in the NBA coaching victories with 1,175 after his playing career that included five seasons in silver and black in both the ABA and the NBA. The Naismith Hall of Fame class will be announced during the Final Four in New Orleans in April, and the induction ceremony will take place in Springfield in September. DeJounte Murray became the first member of the San Antonio Spurs to score six triple doubles in a single season and he still has 52 games left and he came last night against the Clippers as the team played the third game in the fourth night with Murray scoring a triple double in the last three of their last five games. His most recent included 24 points, 13 assists and 12 rebounds in the 116 to 92 victory in LA. When asked about it, Murray says he just wants to play on the court to reflect the way he is off the court. I've been unselfish my whole life as a person. Uh, I like to see people smile before myself, you know, take care of home court, which is my family, friends, uh, and long, I know if they're happy and I know that, you know, the things I'm capable of doing will make myself happy as, you know, possible. So, you know, that's just who I've always been since a kid and uh, it's showing, you know, in my profession being an NBA player. So they get to hang out in Los Angeles because they don't play the Lakers again until Thursday at 9.30. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver says he has no plans to suspend play as COVID-19 surges among teams, even though the league has already postponed seven games this week, including five in the last three days. And the new variant, Omicron, is to blame for the 90% of the cases, according to what Silver told ESPN Today. To help out, the NBA sent a memo to all their teams regarding new rules signing replacement players. It has now become easier to do that. And in fact, it's required that teams have two or more players in health and safety protocols. So if you look at it, it's kind of like the old CBA bus coming in and yeah. dropping off players when you need them the most during all this, well, health concerns. Yeah, it's a good move by the NBA. You got it. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.